With 3 million members searching, singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors Let's Talk About Sex. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Let's Talk About Sex, sponsored by singlemuslim.com. And I am your host, Estela Rodriguez Jabril, licensed clinical therapist and the Muslim sex coach. And we are live here on Sky Channel 752 and across Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And I want to invite all of you to join in on tonight's discussion and get the advice that you want by simply calling in through our through into our studio on 01924 231083. And as always, remember that standard network rates do apply. So make sure that you do have the bill payer's permission before calling in. You can also send us your questions and share your thoughts and comments in confidence by using WhatsApp and messaging us at 07-585-835-150. And if you forget these numbers, remember they're right there on the screen for you to easily access. Tonight is the last episode of season two. And tonight we're talking about sexually transmitted diseases and sexually transmitted infections, also known as STDs and STIs. Can Muslim get them? Are we immune to uh, STDs and STIs? What are the causes? What are the symptoms and what are the treatments? In Islamic countries within Muslim communities, in non-Muslim countries, extramarital sex and premarital relations are prohibited by our religion. So we know this, that this is our faith. It is commonly believed that those countries and communities have the lowest rates of HIV AIDS and sexually transmitted infections and diseases. The prevalence of people living with AIDS and a sexually transmitted disease in the Middle East and North Africa regions is um, and, and as well as the communities in non-Islamic countries, it's really low. It's lower than the world average. And this is because it is believed that HIV AIDS rates and sexually transmitted infections are significantly underreported in Islamic countries and in Muslim communities in non-Islamic countries. Recent available data has revealed that the number of new HIV cases have gone up by 26% between 2004 and 2014, making the growth of, HIV, of the HIV epidemic in the Middle East and the North African region one of the fastest growing globally. Since sexual relations outside of marriage are forbidden in Islam, it's assumed that people are abstaining from sexual relationships until marriage. It is clear that this is not the case with some Muslims and specifically with young Muslims. There are many that are engaging in extramarital, and premarital sexual relations. Despite efforts by advocates such as myself calling for the need to educate young Muslims, their parents, 
and actually all Muslims on sexual health issues and providing services for those who need it in many countries and communities, they fail to prioritize this issue. There is a specific risk of underdetection of AIDS and other sexually transmitted diseases, specifically among women. Sexual activity outside of marriage and before marriage, particularly in Muslim societies, is most often engaged in by men. So Muslim women are especially vulnerable. Now, the vast majority of infections within the Muslim community are among men. And the main route for transmission among women is through marriage. This information comes from research that was conducted by Noura Almer and her colleagues in the UK and in Saudi Arabia. As you can see, sex education, knowledge about sex is vital. We must educate our youth, our men and our women and leadership within our ummah has to make it a priority. Sexually transmitted infections are one of the most under-recognized health problems worldwide. And as Muslims, we are not immune simply because we're Muslims or because we ignore the problem. Sexually transmitted infections are difficult to track. Most people with these infections don't have symptoms and remain undiagnosed. And diseases that are diagnosed are frequently not reported. Information about STIs in Islamic countries and Islamic communities in non-Islamic countries where non-marital sex and homosexuality are prohibited by religion is not notably limited. And this has to change. There are three main areas that need to change. First of all, there's poor knowledge and there's misconceptions about sexually transmitted diseases within our ummah. There's also just the need for sexual health information and it's not easily accessible. It's not easily available. People have to hide you know, themselves or you know, do it behind you know, the backs of those people that they trust to get to the sources of knowledge. So there's a lack of sexual health information and there's a lack of just sources of knowledge. Changing information you know, needs are within our umma, our umma. We have to change information needs within our umma based on cultural influences and attitudes. There are many misconceptions because of poor knowledge about STIs and STDs. Most believe that if the symptoms disappear, it means that the STI is cured, which is not always true. Also, it's believed that STIs can only be spread when symptoms are present. The truth is that STIs require medical treatment. And, you know, the one that has contracted the STI should also get his or her partner, if they're married, checked and treated. The most common source of information is newspapers and magazines, television, and the internet. And it's necessary to address this with appropriate seminars, appropriate courses, appropriate services with qualified experts. Research conducted on Muslims showed that 24% of Muslims 
that practice extramarital relations and premarital relations claimed that they don't seek information about STIs or STDs from any source. So how do you prevent STDs from spreading and infecting? Anyone who has sexual contact with another person that is infected with an STD is at risk of getting an STI. There are eight common STDs, and you can Google these and find out exactly what they are. The treatment vary depending on the type, and most commonly antibiotics are needed as well as a vaccine. So get the facts, get tested if you have had a sexual partner prior to marriage or during your marriage. Delivering high quality care and information of any type to people of the Muslim faith requires knowledge of the difference in culture and spiritual values. Muslim healthcare professionals, as well as knowledgeable scholars can collaborate to set the guidelines to increase knowledge about sex for our ummah. Different cultural backgrounds, influences, attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs towards sex and health education don't need to you know, hold us back from educating ourselves. There are no specific codes with, uh, of medical treatment or physical illness within the Quran. The Islamic tradition, the different, in the Islamic tradition, the difference between health and illness was and still is perceived as balance and imbalance. Historically, there has been, you know, much uh, connection between religion and medicine and practices, and the relationship has always been based on openness and dialogue and knowledge for prevention. So it's so important to be able to educate ourselves and to have accessible information so that our Muslim brothers and sisters, our young Muslim brothers and sisters can get the knowledge and the education that they need to prevent. So as we get ready to take a quick break, I just wanna thank you all for listening in and supporting this. It's just such an important converse, conversation and all of your emails and all of your messages really affirm that this show is very much needed. Remember that you can call into the studio with your questions. You can call into the studio or through WhatsApp and share your comments. The number's right there on the screen for you to connect with us. We'll be taking a quick break and we'll be right back to continue this important conversation so you can be educated. With 3 million members searching, singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors Let's Talk About Sex. With 3 million members searching, singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors Let's Talk About Sex. Welcome back, and let's continue our talk about sexually transmitted diseases and infections and how to be preventive. It's important to have open and honest conversations about sex to be preventive. Without that openness and without that honesty, prevention won't be easy. Every year, more than 18 million new cases of STDs occur in the U.S. alone. How many of those are Muslims? Well, it's not fully known. In the United States, one in four teens will be diagnosed with an STD this year alone. And more than half of all people will be diagnosed with an STD in their lifetime. Do you believe that we have to be proactive? Do you want to be proactive? And do you want to take action? Do you believe it's important for us to take action as an ummah? Or should we just ignore the problem and pretend that this can't happen to us? because we're Muslim. Left untreated, STDs can cause infertility, 
cancer, blindness, and even death. Ignoring it is not a solution. As Muslims, we know that abstinence and waiting to have sex until marriage is to be followed by our faith. And the truth is many are tested by temptations and pressures from life and society. What many Muslims often find surprising is that young Muslims adult, young Muslim adults are engaging in sexual activities before they're married. And this is too without receiving adequate sexual knowledge, adequate sexual health knowledge. For many within our ummah, abstinence is not going to be a permanent viable solution. And without trust, the fear of judgment and criticism will keep so many away from asking for help and asking for guidance and asking for the knowledge because of shame. Now, are we encouraging if we educate about safe sex practices as Muslims, such as correct and consistent use of condoms? Islam gives sex an esteemed status by limiting it to the husband and wife relationship. It is a protective it is a protection to the family structure, which Islam considers a fundamental block of a healthy community. But we also have to remember all of the imperfections that are a part of being a human being in all of the tests and all of the trials and all of the tribulations that many Muslim brothers and sisters are afflicted by within society. So Islam provides solutions to the emotional eagerness of wanting to have sex, yes. And you know, it encourages Muslims to marry as soon as they can. But then there are all those cultural components that affect that as well, right? Or you can fast, you're advised to fast which is a form of restraining the desire. The relationship between sexual health and mental health is not always obvious and not spoken about often enough. Once a person experiences sex or, or has issues with their own individual sexuality or they experience just a you know, challenges and difficulties with the different social attitudes about sexual behavior, this can have a profound influence on the mental health of an individual. Those working in mental health care with Muslims need to pay attention to the specific needs of sexual health education for Muslims. As an ummah, we may not be aware of the sexual realities of young Muslim adults. What many Muslims often find surprising is that that's just the truth, that young Muslim adults are engaging in sexual activities before they're married. And they're doing so without having adequate sexual health knowledge and information. Now for a young, from a very young age, practicing Muslims are taught either implicitly or explicitly that sexual activities are meant to occur within the, the confines of a heterosexual marriage. Other options are rarely presented or discussed or tolerated. As a result, Many young Muslims engage in sexual activities secretly, not comfortable seeking guidance 
because they're afraid, not comfortable seeking advice related to their sexual health because of fears. And they're placing their health at risk, both physically and psychologically, as well as spiritually. A recent review of the very limited research on the sexuality and sexual health of young Muslims in Canada and other Western countries provided insights into what we currently know about the sexual health needs of young Muslims. So what do these reviews say? What does the review of the literature tell us? First, the research shows that young Muslims have inadequate sexual health knowledge when compared to non-Muslims. Yes, young Muslims get the sexual health education offered by their schools and because they don't find it culturally or religiously appropriate, many ignore it. Many young Muslims demonstrate confusion about the information and knowledge about STIs, pregnancy, and birth control. Also, many young Muslims are not getting sexual health education at home. Why? Because, first of all, they're afraid to ask questions themselves. Second of all, it's not a common conversation that most families have. It's not a common conversation that mothers and fathers have with their their children. So speaking about these issues of sexuality with family is not the norm. And what happens? Then they turn to their non-Muslim peers or their peers outside of the family more often than not, and they get the wrong information. They get information that is not helpful. They get information that leads them astray and uh, often encourages behaviors that are not going to lead to making good choices. So in other words, You know, many of our young Muslims are just ill-prepared to navigate sexual situations, you know, putting them at greater risk for sexual vulnerability, such as being sexually coerced or engaging in unprotected sex, when protection can be an option, when protection can increase their chances of preventing any kind of infection. And most importantly, preventing psychological distress. So what are the options? What are the options for solutions? Many young Muslims receive contradictory gendered messages about sexuality, relationships, and sexual health. And it's clear that we do need solutions. We need solutions for our young Muslims. We need, we need solutions for um, our parents out there. We need solutions for our new couples. You can see the relationship between sexual health and mental health is not always apparent. There is no doubt there, there is a strong link though. And as an umma, we must ask our leaders and professionals to create safe sexual spaces for Muslims to share and understand themselves better. Safe sexual spaces to have conversations so that also researchers can further explore these issues of sexuality and sexual health through a caring lens to be able to achieve success in addressing these issues these issues that are not going to go away so that we can ensure that our ummah receives the necessary support and the necessary education and that it is accessible. 
without accessibility, how can we become more knowledgeable? Without creating these safe spaces, how can we prevent? How can we create a strong foundation so that when the temptation is there, there's no fear of asking for help. There's no fear of, of reaching out. So if you have any questions about today's topic, send them in, send them in. If you want to put forward any of your ideas for future shows, please message us in confidence. Thank you once again for watching season two of Let's Talk About Sex, sponsored by singlemuslim.com, along with the whole team here at British Muslim TV. Thank you and assalamu alaikum. Members searching singlemuslim.com proudly sponsors Let's Talk About Sex.